This is now on TTT Talk City 91.1 FM, TTT Live Online and TTT.Live. We want to get into that budget conversation now. Budget convos. I have with me Amilka Sanatan, who is an activist and a youth activist as well. Um, we want to start by talking about youth development because I think that is uh, important for us as a developing country and with the budget set for October 1st, uh, you know, a lot of people want to find out you know, what is in it for the youth. Welcome. Good morning, Rishi. What do you expect out of the budget, first of all? Well, I can't get in the Minister of Finance mm -hmm. head, um, but we can work with some statements that were published before. On the 22nd of September, we have the Minister and the Ministry of Finance who said that or suggested that there will be a relaxation of the austerity practices. The challenge we have as youth advocates and young youth leaders, as we could say, would be that how do we see youth empowerment move from youth empowerment in principle to youth empowerment in practice? When we think about youth, it's not an allocation only to the Ministry of Youth and Sport or Youth and Child Development and so on, but rather how do we think about macroeconomic policy that makes certain considerations for youth. One of it would definitely be youth disaggregated data. Second would be intersectional approaches, which is a big word to talk about race, class and gender, how that affects youth lives. And that is why our housing policy is very important. So I think two major priorities for young people right now it's not just in the realm of education and so on, but in housing and precarious employment, which we need to address. I'm glad you mentioned employment because that is something we always hear young people complain about because they say when they come out of university, um, for those who do, they aren't getting jobs. For sure, that's a big problem. Um, what you have is almost 12 years of government assistance for tuition expenses, so gate program, mm -hmm. and you have a very educated labor force and it overheats the economy in a way. OJT can't absorb that amount of labor. In fact, that kind of distorts the real employment we have in the economy. Mm -hmm. And we have over 40,000 students in the tertiary education system. What does that mean? This has gendered implications. A lot of young women access tertiary education and can't get the kind of jobs that they want. They have precarious employment. Precarious employment is a big word to say a one-month contract. Yeah. When people have one-month contracts, they have difficulties becoming asset holders. When they have difficulties becoming asset holders, they have difficulties being happy in a family life. Exactly. And, and then you can't get a, a mortgage to, to get a house, as sure. you mentioned, is one of the concerns. And yes. that is something that we need to look at addressing when it comes to the youth. Most housing. definitely. Most definitely. <laughs> and then there's underemployment, yes. which is a big thing as well. So you oh, go, man. you study for all of these years, you come out with your degree, your master's, whatever it is, and then you get a job in a store as a store clerk. Not Most degrading definitely. the work that they do, but I'm just saying you come out with that, you expect a, a certain quality of job. Most definitely. So therefore... We have two major challenges, which is how do we create an economy that matches skill sets that we are producing? But the second one is how do we create a climate for people to be innovative and create more room? One, as part of it being entrepreneurship, but very important part of civil society innovations. And how do we create that climate, though? I think what we need is a youth guarantee, as we see in Europe. A lot of the socialist political parties in Europe have advances, and also throughout the world, a youth guarantee. It's not just the way we think about youth welfare, mm -hmm. but how do we have economic policy that is in the interest of youth? A youth guarantee, we talk about not just the number of jobs we need to guarantee for young people, but the kind of economy, which will look at incentives. An important idea that we need to really consider is how do we create creative hubs, not just for creatives, for people in the NGO sector, but also private enterprise, to work collaboratively, take off the course of overheads, and allow them to do the work and advance their ideas. So a lot of young people, mobilization, cash, is not just around the issue of what cash do you need to advance their product or idea? But how do we remove costs? And one of them would be overheads. There's a lot of youth groups in Trinidad and Tobago. Do you think that the youth themselves are doing enough for themselves right now? Because yes, we can say that the government has to do so by so we need these people to help us. But do you think the youth themselves are doing enough for themselves? I think we have a lot of admirable youth groups in Trinidad and Tobago that is addressing the issue of marginality and social exclusion risk and trying to make sure youth don't fall off, you know what I mean? Talking about we need to be positive and so on, that's important, but kind of more privileged young people like myself who work in university and teach there, I have the time to kind of sit down and listen to joint select committees and budgets and have a conversation with them about the bigger structures we need to look at. Just to make the point, the budget is only part of the youth unemployment story. There are historical and structural roots to why we are in the situation that we are in. But how do we get out of it in a way that will be beneficial, in the shortest possible time at least? For sure. I don't think youth unemployment will happen outside of addressing unemployment in the entire economy. And that means we need to have a more dynamic economy. I understand the state, in all fairness to them, have been taking up measures that we really need to cut back. 
but just to maybe nuance what the former central government, the former governor of the central bank said, as we saw in the award ceremony, or even some other major economists, the rule of economic law doesn't govern the country, actually, as a point of politics, to make it more livable. So what do you want to see come out of this budget and moving forward for youth and youth development in Trinidad and Tobago? To hear the word youth one, and also not to say that this will empower youth, but if they could operationalize to say this is actually how this will move a social category of youth by the economic policy. Do you think politicians pay enough attention to the youth, though? Um, I think they pay enough attention and they are aware of the issues, but sometimes lip service means they, doesn't, they don't follow through, and therefore we live up to Terence Farrell's book, We Are the Underachieving Society. So then why, why don't the youth put some more pressure on them? And that's my job, and working with other young people, we need to demand, because power doesn't acquiesce like that. It has to be challenged for it to happen. Because I, I think a lot of times, yes, we have a problem, but we stay quiet, and we don't actually go out there and actually force it so that you know, we can get what is deserving. Most definitely, and, and few people have institutions which reduce the social distance between political leaders and themselves. So that is the point of leadership. Now, a lot of young people are involved with political parties and try to advance our issues, and I respect them. But in the broader society, we need to reduce that gap between our decision makers and ourselves. All right, well, thank you very much, Amilka, Senator, for coming much, in Richard. and chatting with us because youth development is something very important yes, it is. to us here in Trinidad and Tobago and for Trinidad and Tobago to move forward as well. So it was an absolute pleasure chatting with you about that on Budget Compost. All right, and in a short while, we will be speaking about pap smear, the importance of it. What do we need to know? Lisa will be speaking with officials there from the Ministry of Health. We take a break now, and when we come back, we have much more things.